I'm really, really super happy to have Michael Halen uh, on the show today. Um, we're going to have some fun for a change. We're, we're all looking to have fun. Um, we always you know. have fun. Yeah, I was going to say, Dan, this is definitely the fun show. <laughs> this is the fun show. Yeah, but yeah. No, I'm actually no. so- drinking wine today, which is risky. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, so uh, I'm Dan Weisskopf. I'm known as the ETF professor and also co-portfolio manager of the blockchain ETF. And uh, I work with advisors in the ETF think tank and hopefully helping them build better portfolios, which of course these days is is challenging. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over the mic to Cynthia until Dave gets his, his mic stable. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, so excited. We love Thursdays. Thanks for joining us. I'm Cynthia Murphy, head of research for the ETF Think Tank. And you guys know the drill. Grab your drink and bring your questions and join the conversation. So, David, you're up. You're muted, David. There you go. How's it going, everyone? David Tukansky here, fellow portfolio manager, along with these folks here. I focus on the SoFi Be Your Own Boss ETF and the Amplify Inflation Fighters ETF. And inflation will be a very hot topic for today's conversation. And excited to hear how the restaurant industry is handling it and how that may reflect the rest of the overall economy. I'll pass it over to Michael. Hey guys, Mike Venuto here. Um, excited to have our friend uh, Mike Halen back. Uh, we always have a good time when we bring the Bloomberg folks over. Um, uh, what else? Uh, we love to do the the celebration word or toasting word. I think we decided today it was price. Is, did yeah. I catch that right? So price. We say price, have a drink with us. Um, other than that, I guess it's my privilege to introduce Michael Halen. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm the senior restaurant and food service analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Short so- and sweet. Yeah. <laughs> with with, with uh, a lot of coverage you I mean you really do cover a lot of companies and it's a lot of information about macros um i was talking to david earlier and he's like what is it with you on restaurants and i'm like restaurants are ubiquitous and they're not only are they ubiquitous in like they're all over the place but in the economy as well whether it's the impact on the consumer, whether it's a discussion around inflation, um, whether it's about technology, you know, robotics, even heck. Um, so, so I don't get too broad with the discussion. Let me bring it back to you, Michael, and say just a little bit of a tidbit. What are you seeing broadly on the economy um, through the the restaurant lens these days? Sure. So I'm going to first start off before that is to defend you a little bit because you know restaurants are important right it's like nine percent ish of the all the employment in the united states uh it's a canary in the coal mine when uh you know consumers wallets get tight and they start pulling back on spending one of the first things they do is you lower their restaurant bills or they visit less often or they cut back on appetizers and desserts and drinks um and and lower the price of their average check so uh, typically, it's one of the first areas you're going to see consumers pull back on their spending. And so that's going to lead me right into the macro, which, um, you know, the sector's held up better than I expected this year, to be honest. Um, but there's been some pullback in spending, primarily by the low-income consumers. So low-income consumers, um, you know, some of the changes we covered, I think it was McDonald's and Wendy's first mentioned it uh, on their first quarter earnings calls, felt that the low-income consumers were cutting back visiting less frequently or uh, managing their checks a bit. Um, Then in the second quarter, it was pretty much all of the chains we covered mentioned that the low-income consumers had had pulled back. Uh, Interestingly enough, Chipotle said they had more visits, however, from high-income consumers, which offset the loss of the low-income consumers. They said they didn't know if that was because of people were, you know, because people were trending, were trading down from higher, uh, higher cost full service visits to, um, you know, their, their restaurant. Uh, they just didn't have enough data at the time to, uh, to tell us whether that was the case or not. Uh, but that was kind of interesting. Um, since then we've heard from retailers that, um, middle income consumers pulled back on their, 
uh, spending uh, uh, on clothing and, and things of that nature. So uh, we're expecting a continued slowdown of consumer spending here in the third quarter. We're going to find out. Uh, our partner on the data side is Black Box Intelligence, and we haven't seen much of a decline thus far uh, in their numbers. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see. Darden reported their earnings through August. Uh, their three-year stack same-source sales dropped 120 basis points sequentially. So uh, they, they definitely turned down a, a bit. Um, and that's amid a full service, amid full service restaurants taking back some share from, from quick service uh, as people return more frequently to dining rooms. So uh, I think that was a sign that we may see, you know, additional slowing here in, in uh, the third quarter. Uh, I get real busy with earnings starting on Tuesday. So uh, we'll, we'll find out shortly. Well, we got you. Uh, we're glad we got you before the earnings season comes around. Uh, sticking to the whole, the, the, the issue on macros, um, talk to us a little bit about inflation and how restaurants are passing through inflation if they can. The, what you were talking about in California was also pretty, pretty important. Um, talk to us about that too, please. Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, this has been a very difficult year for restaurant earnings. So, uh, as I mentioned, top line is pretty good. Um, not so much on the bottom line. So, restaurants are very careful to price too aggressively, and the restaurants that we cover have increased price uh, aggressively in 2020, 2021, uh, and, and now this year. So, uh, they've been more aggressive this year, increasing prices, probably high single digits on average. Uh, across my universe, which is as high as I've ever seen it, but it's still less than the inflation that they're seeing. And so uh, margins have been taking a significant hit this year. Um, you know, the franchise chains that we cover, you know, think McDonald's, uh, Wendy's, Domino's, they've, they've fared much, much better. Um, but there's been significant uh, inflation due to the, the, you know, what are we seeing? Low, low to mid-teens commodity pressure and high single-digit labor inflation. Um, so, so margins are getting squeezed pretty significantly this year. Uh, and it looks like, uh, inflation is going to continue to be more stubborn, um, than, than most anyone thought, you know, uh, we recently got some year ahead numbers from, uh, Brinker and Darden, and they expect the inflation to remain pretty stubborn for, for at least two more quarters here, uh, going forward. And, uh, you know, the fast act in California is, is interesting, um, you know, they're looking to protect um, quick service employees. And uh, one of the major parts of the bill uh, that was passed on Labor Day is um, creating a board that's going to set uh, a, a minimum wage um, for uh, fast food and quick service employees in California. And they can set it as high as $22 an hour beginning in January. Um, it's very high for a for an entry level job. And, um, you know, they could also raise it up to three and a half percent a year. Uh, they're going to link it to the CPI. Um, so that's a significant increase, you know, almost 50% increase in, um, entry level worker pay in the industry, you know, and we don't think it's going to be limited to fast food. You know, first of all, um, you know, we think people are, and it's not going to be limited to the entry level worker either. So, you know, they may have GMs or assistant GMs in a fast food chain making, you know, $22 an hour now. So they're going to want to continue to make a premium over the entry level worker. You're going to have longer tenured employees that are also going to want to have continue to make a premium over somebody that's brand new that doesn't know what's going on yet. Right. So um, full services is also going to be impacted because if they're paying their cooks right now, $19, $20 an hour, well, a cook is in the back of, of the house at a full service restaurant is working. It's hot. It's stressful. It's dangerous at times. So if they're back there making 18, 19, 20 dollars an hour, and they could just go make 22 bucks working for McDonald's, I, I think um, they might just do that. And so full service is also going to be forced to, to increase their um, pay rates to compete for labor. And in, in which we know is a, a very tight, tight labor market for re restaurants and, uh, all the other industries here in the United States. And um, and then finally, there's already talk of other states trying to enact something similar. So uh, Oregon, Washington, New York State are, are some of the states that are kind of top of mind that could um, 
kind of adopt a, a similar type of uh, ad adopt similar type a similar type of bill. Um, it's, uh, before you jump in, can I just follow on one quick thing he said so we don't lose that thread, which is a question about this wage pressure. Like I had two kids who are not in college and they both, you know, spend their summers applying for jobs. And I remember this past summer, it was amazing to see that the, the per hour uh, wage at restaurants, whether it was quick service or full service, is much higher than in any other regular retailer, whether it's a sporting goods store or a store at the mall or whatever. And I found that amazing that restaurants are paying a lot more than any other type of retail. So I'm just curious, is wage pressure higher in this part of the consumer discretionary world versus other pieces of it? Yeah, the short answer is yes, for sure. And it's a great question. And I think a, a big chunk of it, I think a survey I saw was, you know, a, a large percentage, maybe I think it was almost 30% of people that worked in the restaurant business prior to the pandemic don't want to go back to it. Right. It's, it's a difficult, stressful, uh, job. And, um, you know, I think also too, with the pandemic, people were worried about exposure to COVID and, um, they found other jobs, you know, whatever they may be. Um, and, and they decided that they didn't want to go back to the restaurant business. And, um, with the market being labor market being as tight as it is right now, it, it's very, very hard to find qualified restaurant employees and so yeah they have to pay up and and it's a problem because you know our our uh, partner at black box intelligence you know they've done some very interesting research that that tells us you know the big best correlation between sales at a restaurant is a uh, performance of your general manager right so if you can't find highly skilled qualified general managers with experience uh you know your store could struggle so it, it's critically important and you know that's why uh, we've seen so much, um, so much inflation in, in terms of wages at the restaurants or have, having to pay their employees. My, uh, my question is a good follow on. Um, it's very much in line with that. I was going to actually ask um, something we've been writing about for a couple months is the sustained inflationary pressures or wage growth in lower income jobs specifically um, over kind of like office jobs. Uh, but is the other side of it is in this industry specifically is $22 enough to bring Gen Z to the table in the service industry, because that's been one of the biggest constraints is their lack of interest in involvement um, in a lot of industries that normally have a high level of employment from young professionals. Um, so Cynthia, your kids exactly like, are they like, no, I don't want to do that. Even though it's like $25 an hour, maybe, you know, you're, you're the one to ask. Oh, over, they, they did it like, because they didn't have they a did, choice. Yeah. It's like pick a job. So it wasn't, yeah. Like, yeah. So, but, but yeah. yeah. Well, listen, it's interesting because, um, you know, restaurants, is, restaurants are a great first place to work. Um, you know, I worked a little bit as a short order cook as a kid and, um, you know, it's typically a, a pretty significant employer of, of young people, like high school kids, right? And it's a lot of people you speak to, the first job they had was at a restaurant, bussing tables, right? And at $22, $23 an hour, I mean, is there any, you know, we have, I have a, I have a 14 year old, there's no way that kid is worth $23 an hour to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I love him. He's the best kid ever, but, uh, that's a lot of money to be paying somebody with zero experience. Right. So, um, it, it makes it difficult for, you know, young people to, to have a job and, uh, in it and start out in this industry. And I think that's who kind of gets hurt most, um, you know, with, with some of these, um, you know, significant, increases in, in minimum wage right and, you know i have a good friend and he has a landscaping business and he's like he's like i have to pay kids so much more than i used to and they're just they're just not worth it right but he's ha having trouble finding good employees so it's kind of what he has to deal with at, the, at this point so you know i think so and i think the long-term answer isn't going to be bringing kids in it's going to be increased automation i mean you know, a lot of the chains, especially the ones that are based out in California, they've seen this coming down the pike with the Fast Act, and they've been working on automation throughout the stores. I mean, um, Chipotle's been working on a AI-powered uh, chip uh, chip making robot called Chippy. Uh, we have um, 
Jack in the Box, another California based uh, company that's that's working on the fryer automation. Um, McDonald's is not California based, but you know they installed kiosks throughout their their all of their U.S. stores over the last like four years or so, and that was a a great move. And and we expect a lot of their competitors to follow suit. So yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see more automation. You're gonna see um, from the big chains, the, the companies that can afford it, because you know, listen, it's capex, it's a tax write off, right? So if you have the capital, you're gonna you're gonna you know use it to 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 buy, to automate your stores. Whereas labor just keeps getting more expensive, and it hits your P and L, and it hits your earnings, and um, so it's just, it, it makes a whole lot of sense if you have the money to employ it on automation technology. And that's, you know, a big reason, a big advantage for, you know, the companies that I cover versus small mom and pop shops and independent restaurants. So um, a couple of things. First off, um, everybody can be witness. I'm sending my son to visit with Cynthia this summer so that he can get a proper job of working at restaurants because I clearly don't have the discipline that she does. I congratulate you, Cynthia. Um, and my son is going to be 19 very shortly, or 20 shortly. Um, so beyond that, here lies one of the key problems, right? One of the things you said was that the restaurant industry employs about 9% of, of employee employers, right? Or employees, rather, in our economy. So how can you know, wage inflation be transitory? And are we going to end up getting stuck for the next, you know, two, three, 10 years with wages being so high and not being able to offset that higher price? By the way, price is, is our word in case anybody forgot. Um, technology can only impact so much in, in this industry as an example. A lot there. Yeah, the but uh, yeah, but you know the thing about technology is over time it gets cheaper, right? And and uh, you know and that and that's kind of what we've seen um, uh, with server handhelds, for example, right? And so um, five years ago, there was a few of our chains that were using server handhelds. Uh, Brinker was pretty early on that, but they were only using it in LA and Washington because the minimum wage was fifteen dollars. So there was an ROI at that. Um, at that price. But over the last five years, we've seen massive wage inflation and the price of the technology has dropped. So that combination now has enabled price. Brinker price has <laughs> enabled Brinker to to um, roll them out throughout the country. And now that they have a R they have an ROI. Those server handholds have an ROI throughout the country. And those things are great. Because now instead of five, you know, uh, instead of one of your servers covering uh, three tables, they can cover five, right? And and so then you can eliminate some of the servers from your floor. You can eliminate the worst servers from your floor. You can keep your best servers. So now more of your customers have a better experience, right? It boosts sales, um, eliminates labor. It's 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 really a win all around and and so that's that's an early example now if we're getting to more robotics and some some other in interesting things but um you know like i said over time the price of the technology drops and wage inflation can just continues marching on and uh it, it creates a, eventually we get to a point where the technology makes sense um so on that um what's the most interesting kind of innovative thing you've seen a restaurant do or a quick service chain to try and navigate the the pressure of inflation and wage and still bring people to the door like i'm thinking mcdonald's adult happy meals where the toys are now auctioning off for like i saw one just auctioned off for like twenty five thousand dollars. so what are some of the gimmicks you're seeing out there that are kind of interesting in the space well, in terms of gimmicks, McDonald's has been killing it uh, with their famous orders promotion. Uh, BTS meal was like a monster, not just here in the U.S., but uh, globally. Um, you know, I'm not a big Korean pop fan, but apparently a large portion of the population is. And, um, you know, that they've done a really good job. You know, honestly, though, it's it's not a complicated business. And it's the companies that serve good food that that tastes good and provide great service are, are really the ones that are 
are drawing people through the doors. Like Chipotle isn't, they're absolutely knocking the cover off the bowl and they're not doing anything fancy, right? They're serving, um, you know, pretty solid food. there, good food for the price point and uh, they're doing it efficiently and um, yeah, price point. Uh, so, so uh, it, it's not really, there's not necessarily, you know, there's not really much magic to it. Texas Roadhouse is one that's absolutely not the cover off the ball too. I mean, full service, our full service chains, I think three or same store sales were up 7% in the second quarter and Texas Roadhouses were up like 30, which is incredible. You know, a uh, part of that is like uh, much, uh, much greater to go business than they ever had. Uh, they've kind of held on to that post pandemic. Uh, and it's kind of an experience. So you go and there's line dancing and they're popular for birthday parties and things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, they're providing a, a good meal at a great price with phenomenal service. I, I mean, the companies that are doing the best are are just providing, you know, great food service ambiance. And and that's that's kind of really always been the formula in the restaurant business. So, uh, I'm actually going to ask a question from the chat because uh, I think it leads from the things you answered for Weisskopf and Cynthia. Um, I love the whole question, though, uh, on the uh, what kind of innovative things they're doing. And Warren references uh, Royal Caribbean's robot that makes drinks. Um, I tried it when I was on the cruise. I don't know if I, I, I don't know if that's where I got COVID, but somewhere I did. And <laughs> it was pretty slow compared to a real bartender. Um but I want to read uh, Matt's question because it, it comes back to this inflation from a different angle. And he's asking, uh, is there a price point where consumers will not be willing to use technology at the restaurant and expect a server? Right. Like, like I, I remember we used to work a lot with Robo Global and they told us, you know, 10 years, all food is going to be made by robots. It hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, is there a price point, though, where people want people? Like we see that in asset management, right? People, well, I said price point like three times. Sorry, I forgot that's the word. Um, we got to pace but, ourselves here. Yeah. We're getting too fast all of a sudden. <laughs> all right, I said enough. Fire away. Yeah, so <laughs> I think that's a great. I think that's a great question, and it depends on the the service mode. It depends on the sub segment of the industry, right? So, in the kitchen at McDonald's, like who cares, right? Like it doesn't really matter. Um, and then even also up front at McDonald's in the front of the house, it doesn't matter either because people are enjoying the, using the kiosk. The younger generations want kiosks. They're spending more money on the kiosk. There's less pressure. It's not, it's not nobody breathing down their neck, you know, like, uh, you know, forcing them into like just rushing into some order, you know, it's, it's, uh, using suggestive selling to, 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 uh, convince them to buy additional products with their order. Um, so uh, when it comes to QSR, I don't think it matters really at all on the other end of the spectrum at the high end, it does matter, right? People want, uh, that human touch, right? They want to feel, um, the connection with their server. And, and I think that's a, a very important, uh, part of, you know, high end restaurant service and, you know, the full service and the fast casual names, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, right? So I can't imagine Chipotle without you know, the person in front of you taking your order and making it in front of you. Um, but the person grilling the chicken may not be necessary, right? If we can, if they can figure out a ro robot to, to do that, obviously uh, they, they don't think people really care about uh, who makes their chips, whether it's uh, human or Android. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think we'll see different, different levels of automation and different types of uh, restaurants. And so, uh, you know, in terms of, you, you mentioned the, the Carnival Cruise robot. So uh, an interesting one was Brinker. They had, were testing a robot uh, at the um, host stand uh, to, to seat customers. And then they, they um, started testing that robot as a busboy, but um, they, they pulled back on that test. They're, they're uh, more concerned about um, operations and some uh, some other issues that they're having, like pulling back on, on discounts and things of that nature. So, so they've kind of they pulled back on that test, but, uh, yeah, robots have been tested in the restaurant industry as well. And then I think a few years ago, I forget the name Itza, maybe, I think it was Itza. They had a, a restaurant or two down in DC and they were fully automated and, and it didn't really work. Uh, I think part of it was maybe just the vibe of the store 
you know, um, and the fact that they promoted the fact that they had no humans. And I think it, that might have like freaked people out. But who knows? Maybe it was just ahead of ahead of its time, you know. So, um, Michael, uh, let's see. So I've got a fun question and then a serious question. I'm going to because after this, I'm sure Venuto is going to cut me off on asking questions. Um, so my fun question is, yeah, I was in I was in North Carolina and I was shocked by the long line at Texas Roadhouse. Um, you know, are they the best value right now in terms of either fun or you know happy hour drinks? I could because I couldn't couldn't believe it. And then the second one is the second question I have is. Um, is money still pouring in in the way of private equity towards restaurants? And is there any innovation in the restaurant industry as well? So I got three. Sorry, man. <laughs> All right. Let, um, so at Texas Roadhouse, it's the rolls, man. Everybody loves the rolls. But uh, no, I think it's more than that. I, I think, like I said, I think it's uh, experience and it's the value, right? They they do a phenomenal job of – of. Um, you know, managing price there. And they're able to do that because of the volume that they're running through those restaurants, man. I mean, you know, they're well over $7 million on, on average per, per unit and, and the check is not all that high. So they're running a lot of people through that restaurant. Uh, they're giving people a great experience. It's, it's a fun experience. The food's good. Um, you know, I think all of that, you know, they're, they're really, um, you know, the quality of the food and the service is like, core to that brand's DNA and, um, you know, and the GMs, like they treat their GMs really well. GMs uh, are in, have a profit sharing agreement. And what I mentioned earlier, you know, the, that, the correlation between a strong GM and a uh, strong restaurant performance, you know, their GMs, they don't have turnover as high as the rest of the industry because they let them participate in the profits and they motivate them to figure out ways to grow sales. And, um, you know, giving them a chunk of the operating profits, uh, it's, a, it's the old Outback Steakhouse model, which, you know, is a great model. If, if You know, it, not everybody could do it, but if your company has that entrepreneurial mindset and uh, can can get away with it, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal model to have. Um, what was the second one? I had three. I don't even remember all of them. Um, so, so I one was about private equity pouring money yeah, still oh, into yeah, right. the restaurant. That I, I I killed myself on how private equity was so excited about uh, the restauranters because it's an asset like business model. So it all made sense to me. But is private equity very still very very active? And the third question was about innovation. Where are you, where are you seeing restaurants innovate? Yeah. So um, in concept, by the way, not yeah, not technology. Yeah. For sure. So, um, you know, in terms of private equity, I, you know, we've seen a slowdown, you, you know, um, what we've seen over time in this business is that, you know, what used to happen is like private equity would go in and kind of turn around floundering established chains, right? And then fix them up, cut some costs, uh, you know, rebuild the sales, uh, and then flip it back out, right? And so historically, that was kind of the 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 model uh, in restaurants. Um, over time, though, these these uh, private equity funds, you know, they re haven't really, you know, a lot. Most of the chains that I cover are well run, right? And so there's not really any problem chains out there for them to 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 acquire and fix up. So over time, it's kind of morphed into more of an investment in these emerging chains, and they've been putting money into smaller and smaller chains over time, and. Um, you know, so I think there's still interest out there. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't really know, to be honest with you, um, how much money has been poured into some of these smaller chains over the last, uh, you know, 10 months or so of this year. Uh, but I'd imagine it, it's slowed down. Um, we've seen less deals from some of the larger private buyers like uh, Inspire Brands and, you um, you know, chains like that, uh, you know, JAB was a big player in, in the coffee and uh, breakfast space for a while. And, and we haven't seen, heard too much from them recently. Um, you know, and I think part of it is really based on the uncertainty, right? It's, it's, it's been a tough, it's been a tough year plus for restaurant investors, right? We had five or six, five IPOs last year in the second half. And um, most of them, the last time I, I checked, they were down about 70% each uh, off of their highs. 
uh, in the last year. So it, it's been tough, a tough year for, for restaurant investors and uh, it's slowed down, but it, you know, eventually it, it will come back. And then in terms of innovation, you know, you're seeing, and the reason why private equity is investing in some of these small chains, you're seeing some of these small chains do some really cool stuff. And um, whether it's around um, sustainability, whether it's about charitable giving, um, you know, you've seen all sorts of different types of uh, cuisines kind of um, try their hand at the the Chipotle model, right? That, that that Chipotle, everybody wants to be the next Chipotle. And so uh, you've seen, you know, Mediterranean like Cava expand pretty aggressively. And, um, you know, there's, there's different types. Indian cuisine has, has kind of tried, tried that model. And, and so, um, you know, as, as Americans kind of become, you know, these younger generations of Americans are, are a lot more um, exploratory with their eating habits. They're much more open to spicy food and different ethnic foods. Um, I think that's where we, that's where we've seen a lot of the, the innovation. You know, and then and then with the smaller brands too is like they get more innovative with technology, right? When you can, when you're starting, you know, kind of from a clean slate, you can, um, you can really implement um, the right technology, and you can do it in a smart way. Whereas a lot of these established chains have to go and undo some of the things that they've done in the past, like you know, redo their entire POS system or or take out technology that had been implemented previously and, and kind of um, it, it's a lot more difficult for the more established chains to, to, to create uh, restaurants that are, that are very tech forward. And, and some of these emerging chains, chains are doing a much better job of that. Daniel, you got a question? Go for it. I do. I have something to say and a couple of questions. So I definitely consider myself a foodie, but my patterns have changed post COVID. So I really find myself either eating at somewhere like fast casual or on the complete opposite side of that spectrum, like somewhere more luxurious, like a steakhouse. I've kind of, you know, eliminated the middle of the pack. And I think that a lot of people are in the same boat. So my question is, are you seeing similar consumer behavior in the data or in the earnings, because I have a, peop, a feeling that people in the middle are going to feel the pain the most uh, during this next recession. Or do you think that these restaurants who are in that middle group are going to be able to make up the money in other ways, like leveraging Uber Eats and some of these other, um, you know, tech-focused softwares to help supplement their main business? Where do you live, Daniel? I'm in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale. All right, nice. I yeah, was I was gonna make a joke about that because I can't ever find anything to eat in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> yeah, we usually, we usually have to take the trek down to Miami if you yeah, want. You got to go to Miami yeah. or up. I just, but yeah, Fort Lauderdale, what is like runway eighty four or whatever, and it's like, <laughs> it's like yep. something out of a a mob movie from the seventies. <laughs> like, right? It's either yeah. Miami or Palm Beach. You got to do yeah. Dorada. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually, I actually just uh, last week I was riding a bicycle for charity uh, through Florida. I, I, I started nice. in Jupiter, ended up in Key West, so I was I spent a couple of days in Miami. You know, listen, man. I think first of all, I'm going to say that um, the middle, the like casual dining chains that we cover, they've been doing pretty well this year, and and a big part of it is that people are uh, coming back into the dining rooms, right? They last year they were still weren't fully comfortable a lot of people in terms of going to the dining rooms especially older patrons um a now that's so they've they've won back business that way uh also too in a lot of places in middle america you know outside of new york and miami and la there's not that many options right so uh you know they don't have a kiki on the river in in you know mobile alabama you know what i mean so right. so I, I i think that that's part of it when you're thinking about this business is 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 understanding that um, you know, people in middle America, um, live very differently than we do on, on the coast. But, uh, I, I do agree with you in the sense that I think that the middle income consumers, uh, going to get squeezed. I think they're already getting squeezed that the, their, their incomes are increasing, which is great. Um, but not increasing as fast as, as the inflation that we're seeing and, you know, gas prices thankfully have come down a bit, but, uh, they're still significantly higher than they were two years ago. Um, you know, we're looking at, much higher bill, utility bills this winter. Uh, you know, my electric bills are already significantly higher than it was a year ago. Uh, and all these things I think are really going to, you know, to your point, continue to squeeze 
uh, the middle income consumers. So, you know, where do I, what do I see from the full, like casual dining chains um, right now, the Chili's, the Applebee's of the world, you know, right now they're getting hit by the low income consumer. I think they're going to get hit when the middle income consumer starts to pull back if they haven't already. Um, I think, um, you know, they have been helped by higher levels of to go. You know, that shift during the pandemic has stuck. Most of the chains we cover are doing, you know, they were probably doing about 10% of their business, 10 to 12% of their business and take out. Uh, now it's like double that, you know, now it's like about 25%. So that's been good for them um, now that they figured out the economics around that. Um, so, you know, to your point, I, I, I think you're you're definitely onto something. And, and it's a reason why, um, you know, we've seen traffic, decline in that sector since the last recession, right? So this has been, I don't know, 15, 16 years of declining traffic in that segment. So uh, it, it's, it's that middle has definitely been a, a tough segment uh, to be in. And they've been squeezed by, by fast casual, right? It's like food that's just as good, sometimes even better and at a cheaper price point, right? Cause you're not tipping it. And then you're not tipping a server and you don't have alcohol and appetizers and desserts and stuff like that. So yeah, middles have been a tough place to pay play for about 15 years, and 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 I don't see an end to that. Thanks. Yeah, sure. And I guess one more tidbit to that is uh, another thing helping them is is uh, independent restaurants closing. So I think about 10 percent of restaurants across the country have closed. A large percentage of those were independents, and then also some of them were some of these legacy uh, casual dining brands like Applebee's who closed uh, a, a good chunk of their stores during the uh, post pandemic. What does, uh, so you mentioned a little bit on the energy front or gas front, what, what percentage of EBITDA is eaten up by energy levels where they are today or where they were a couple months ago? And also how much it, like, is it just an effect of like less patrons visiting because of the cost for them to get to your store, right? Especially when you're outside of these major cities. So how much is it like the internal margins or and how much is it top line driving potential customers away because of the cost of going from A to B? Yeah, so when you're talking natural gas, you know, that's, uh, you know, whatever, 5%, maybe less of, of a restaurant's cost, 5% or so of, of a restaurant's cost. Um, when you're talking about gasoline, the problem there is, you know, historically gas prices don't have a huge correlation to restaurant sales. For most of my companies, uh, Cracker Barrel is one that has had a correlation historically. And the reason why is, you know, 85% of their stores are located on interstates. Uh, it's people that are doing summer vacation trips. Uh, they also have their their uh, the retail store uh, at the front. So when people are getting hammered by gasoline, uh, they go to a, 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 a Cracker Barrel, you know, they're, they're going to spend less uh, in the restaurant or in the retail store. Uh, the problem this time, you know, the when we do see an impact on the increase in gas prices is when it's rapid. You know, and, and that's exactly what we've seen over the last few years is an absolutely parabolic move in the price of gas prices. Um, uh, I, I redundantly said prices, so now we got to drink three times. Um, but but that's but that's uh, that's when you feel it when the price uh, accelerates very rapidly, and that's that's exactly what we've seen. And like I said, prices are coming back down, um, but. Uh, we're, we're still higher than two years ago. And then the other place where you see the higher gas prices, it shows up in the food costs, right? So it costs money to ship this food all across the country. So when, when gasoline uh, prices jump, um, that's the first, you know, step in, in higher food costs. So um, we've been, I feel like we've been talking mostly about the U.S. But there are restaurants in Europe, there are restaurants in China, there are restaurants everywhere, right? Talk to us a little bit about uh, what's happening. I mean, I'm fearful about Europe, particularly in, in the on the on the energy side, and also getting hit on the recession side too, right? What what are you thinking beyond just the U.S.? Yeah, and uh, you know we've done some research to see to, to kind of look at at um, European exposure. So let's start with China because that's pretty easy. I mean, it's it's like sales do well or 
do poorly in fits and starts. And it's all based on that zero COVID policy, which is, is kind of ridiculous if you ask me. But um, so you've seen fits and starts and we just kind of got to look back in our notes and see how it did last year, a quarter ago and what what the what percentage of stores were closed last year versus what they expect to be uh, closed this year and, and kind of figure that out. Um, China now is lapping some some significant closures and the st their stores are opening back up. So China's looking a little bit better year over year. Europe is the big concern. Um, for my companies, luckily they're, they're mainly franchised in Europe. So uh, it won't hurt as bad, but Europe is a, a major concern. Europe year to date, uh, well, I should say through the first half did pretty good because they were lapping pretty significant uh, restaurant closures and restaurant restrictions, right? So Europe was a source of growth for some of my companies, for most of my companies that operate there in, in the first half, uh, also for the food service chains we cover. That's going to change, right? Um, you know, uh, natural gas prices are, are, you know, went through the roof. Um, you know, their consumers weren't, didn't receive the same sort of uh, stimulus that American consumers received. You know, they got some VAT, ta uh, VAT tax holidays and things of that nature, but they didn't receive the level of support that, U.S. customers have. Their economies aren't as strong as the U.S. economy. So Europe is uh, a question mark. And, you know, for all those reasons that you mentioned, and uh, add on top of that, the strength of the U.S. dollar. So foreign exchange is going to be a pain point in the, in the third quarter for all of the companies we cover. The U.S. dollar has been one of the strongest performing assets, um, you know, globally here this year. And, and you know, for the, the international chains that we cover, um, it, it's definitely going to be a pain point here in the second half. So I was going to ask, actually, I've always been puzzled uh, on the ETF space, why uh, restaurant ETFs really struggle to find a footing because thematic ETFs are a huge deal. There is all sorts of crazy things out there that we wonder how does this thing even find a buyer? I can't imagine anybody on, on this show today would live without going to a restaurant. So restaurants are such a big part of everyone's life. I just, why do you think that as an investment theme, it's so difficult to get traction on a basket of restaurants. Um, is it because margins are always so tight? Is it because your point for the last 15 years, this middle segment where a lot of people navigate has struggled? You know, is there something that gets lost in the conversation about the the proposition, the value proposition here of this as a as a theme? I, I just don't know why these ETFs really struggle to find a following. Dan probably knows this answer better than I. I mean, I, I'm just going to kind of guess here. I'm going to say, you know, the problem, part of the problem is probably with so many small mid caps, right? I mean, there's not too many uh, large cap companies that I cover, you know, Chipotle and uh, McDonald's and Starbucks and Darden and everybody else is like a smaller mid cap. I, you know, I, um, this crew knows better than me if, if that causes issues. Uh, on the ETF side or not, just liquidity of the, the companies that you're uh, invested in. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, you know, restaurants are just interesting in general. You get a lot of retail money in it. You know, people like to invest in things they know and they have a good restaurant experience at Texas Roadhouse and they want to go buy the stock. And um, I like that because um, it adds volatility to, to the sector, uh, a sector that's already volatile because um, – because of the size of the companies, as well as the, the, you know, how quickly things can change and the, the shortness of, of like the likes life cycle of, of a chain right now. So uh, I don't know. I wish I, I had a, a better answer for you, but you know, maybe those are some of the issues. Yeah, no, we're all discovering it together. So I, I, it, I it love really, that you're also puzzled. Yes. It's, it is, it is amazing. Like, I mean, we've seen three or four of these. Dan did one. Um, I helped with another one and then, you know, I, I, I was just looking at the advisor shares one. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 oh, you I mean, $2 million, $2 million. Yeah. And yeah. like you said, the holdings are questionable. The first stock is Archos Dorados, which is like a bunch of McDonald's chains in Mexico. The second one is a, the strip club. I didn't I don't want know to who's go eating there. there right? like, <laughs> well, profit uh, margins, right? Uh, yeah, well, a cash I mean, business maybe, that you know. Uh, <laughs> um, no, you know, what could be interesting. Maybe is like 
you know, there's there's a, a wide array, and I, maybe part of it is people are scared off by by some of the numbers that they hear. You know, whatever ninety percent of restaurants go out of business in in the first year, and whatever other nonsense people have kind of spewed out over the years. Maybe that's part of it. Um, but they, but they've been real rock star performers, right? Like like Cracker Barrel was like a crazy stock forever. Like yeah, look at Dom, look at Domino. Domino right? was in the last and, recession. It was two bucks, right? Yeah. So like. Maybe there's a different angle. Maybe you say, uh, maybe you go after the franchisees. You know, maybe that's a uh, uh, franchise businesses are great, man. They, they, uh, their earnings well, cash flow are easier, easy to predict, um, asset light. And so they can return a lot of cash to shareholders. And, you know, maybe you guys, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe the answer well, is a franchise I, ETF that's heavy into restaurants, but there's other franchises out there, right? Yeah. Um, that can maybe that's a cool idea basket. because I think that might be the issue. And maybe you could shed light on the issue. They don't seem very homogenized, right? Like part of what makes a thematic ETF or a, a, um, subsector, because this isn't really thematic, it's really a subsector, right? Um, it's the fact that there's factors that move them all pretty similar, right? And you're really in an, in a structure like that, trying to remove the idiosyncratic risk of a single company, but you're expecting the area to move the same. I, I I've seen this from the ones we've done in the past, and even looking at Rick's cabaret there in the ETF, <laughs> um, uh, they don't really move together. Some they. Th yeah. there's there's a lot of things that make each one of them different from that perspective they behave more like a thematic so maybe that's why there's just not um i like his know, idea i think it's a good idea the franchise one yeah i think it is yeah, good. well because yeah, you guys come in most subsectors you're a bloomberg employee you can't get in on this <laughs> <laughs> most you subsectors in general yeah, don't get a lot of flows most subsectors don't get a lot of flows in general so you need to find a common link or theme to cross subsectors that are still it's where it's still like highly concentrated and something like that would definitely do that yeah and so listen maybe that's part of the issue with restaurants too it's like you know you have quick service which are heavily franchised and you know my name's you know they've been hit this year but they've moved more closely to the broader closer to the broader market in the s p whereas you know, my casual dining names, which are largely company owned. So there's a lot of operating leverage in that model. Once people realized, uh, you know, second quarter last year that they were going to have margin issues and that, that estimates were way too high for 2023, those things started getting smoked, you know, well over a year ago. So, uh, I think that's, that's, part of it right like the, these two segments these two very large segments of the restaurant industry do not always move uh very closely together you know and um rush and also too you know quick service names held in until the, re the broader market dropped because in the pandemic they did so well and so everybody had this you know it's like oh quick service is now recession proof which is total bs um but that was out there and it was supporting their, you know, 30 times PE multiples heading into this year. And, um, you know, I, I think in the, in the next recession, everyone, if we're not in it already, uh, in the first deep next deep recession, I think everyone will realize that, oh yeah, that's right. These themes aren't recession proof. You know, we were just talking about. Yeah, and they probably won't be another giant stimulus package directed at restaurants. <laughs> like, like, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, outside sure. of the big public ones, the private ones, Really, we're like told, shut the door, but here's all the money you made the last two years. Like, yeah, uh, last sure. 10. For sure. 10. And then look, yeah. at, look at Domino's. You know, we mentioned, we keep talking about Domino's, but, you know, it was two bucks uh, in the last recession, but for a reason. You know, there was concern that their franchisees were, were running out of capital and they may um, experience a liquidity event. And their same store sales were then down 10% year over year, right? So, so clearly QSR is not. Uh, fully recession proof, but that was definitely one of the uh, talking points uh, of, of 2020, uh, 2021. So, so Cynthia, we'll take your question offline because I lived the dream trying to make it live. Right. And, and a lot of it's perception. I think it's been a lot of bad timing and some cannibalization as well. Um, but the idea on the franchise size is, is something that I also did a lot of research on because it's asset light. It's a huge percentage of the economy. You think that 
nine percent of the economy i'm sorry nine percent of the employees are in the restaurant industry when you factor in the franchise industry it's like i don't know two three x that right in terms of employees um and and so uh, we'll, we'll take that offline um so but you brought up something very interesting michael um are we in a recession because the restaurant industry can telegraph that um you know, it, it's been an interesting year, and and it's hard for me to tell you because I don't have independent restaurant data, right? I, I know, I know that restaurants in the city are, you know, in in urban centers in cities are well, well, well below at sales levels, well, well, well below uh, 2019 uh, right now. But you know, the sales are better than they were last year, right? Like, so we're, it, there's all so many moving pieces. I don't have a ton of information on independence. I do know overall restaurant spending is not up, you know, 10% in, in casual dining because there's been a lot of store closures, right? So, uh, you know, versus, I'm talking about versus 2019 levels. So you know, it, because we don't have independent data, it makes it really, really hard. Um, my chains are not showing the top line of my chains are not showing a recession, but I'm sure independents are painting a, a much different picture. Um, you know, cities look, uh, and, and the same thing, especially for independents and, and small chains located in, in urban areas. I know they're, they're struggling. And it's part of the reason why Shake Shack but has been struggling. They're, they're mainly located in urban centers and out of the, all, all of the companies we cover in the second quarter, they trailed by 30 basis points on a three, I mean, I'm sorry, 30 basis points, 30 percentage points on a three year same store sales basis, right? So they're down uh, 14% or so. And the quick service chains we covered were on average up, you know, 15 ish percent. So, um, you know, we know there's pro pockets of problems, but I, I just don't have uh, accurate industry wide numbers that can really, really tell us whether we're in the recession or not. So I know the majority of cities in the U.S. are work centers, and you know there's obviously a transition to loft trans, uh, 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 flips, and people are are living more in the actual cities. But in a city like New York, there's vast portions of it that are are not work focused, um, and so I've seen like some chains or restaurants that are focused on the work crowd obviously are hurting substantially, but. Those that were more targeting residential non-work center areas are actually thriving because people are there more often, right? And picking up from the local establishments around there and maybe not as much from the work center. So who's thriving on that end? Um, is there anyone of note or, or are they too yeah. small? Yeah, it's it's kind of too small, but what you know, I could. But to your point, I mean, that's what we saw, right? In the Upper West Side, you know, a lot of restaurants did well, you know, and these are small restaurants, independent restaurants, but they did really well because it's in a residential area. But Times Square was closed for two years, right? So if you had a restaurant there, you were you, you're getting crushed, right? Um, there was no business; you didn't even open your doors. It wasn't worth it. Um, so it, it, location has been important. It's been interesting, man, because real estate's gotten flipped on its head. You know, I, I spoke to, you know, some CEOs and they're like, you know, of these smaller chains, um, you know, maybe a few dozen stores. And they're like, it was crazy. You know, our biggest performing stores were in business centers. They're now our worst performing stores. You know, the good thing is they were able to like renegotiate their rents, but then some of the dogs in their portfolio that were in the suburbs are now some of the biggest, uh, you know, best performing stores in the portfolio. So real estate's really got you know, flipped on its head. And, and um, I, I, I don't think anyone really knows how it all shakes out, right? Like telecommuting is up and it's going to continue to um, be higher than it was pre pandemic. And, and, uh, but who knows where it settles out. Right. And, and what does that mean for these restaurants that are uh, heavily located in, in business centers, you know, and that's, that's part of the issue um, for, you know, I mentioned Shake Shack, but I'll mention it again because, you know, they're, they're expanding aggressively and it's, you know, they've been moving into the suburbs more aggressively. And I think a big part of that is, is just the uncertainty around urban locations. Go ahead, Eric. Am I on? Yep. Oh, great. Uh, so uh, back to the question on spend, uh, both uh, city and Bank America 
break out their credit card data, which is about as good an inclusion factor as you're gonna get for the independents. And their uh, restaurant spend is up like 10 to 15%, depending on the metro area, uh, over 19. Uh, that's versus an overall credit card spend of like up 18 to 20% uh, over those uh, three year uh, look. Uh, so restaurants have definitely lost share as a percent of spend, but they're still doing you know reasonably well uh, overall. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, what? How do they factor in the restaurants that closed? Well, they're just looking at the category of business. So they'll give you like hotel, planes, and this is gotcha. restaurants. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, it's helpful. Thanks. Hmm. Eric's always got a cool data source. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, so we, some rapid fire: Popeyes or Bojangles? Popeyes. I'm just we're teasing. Talking about, we're, talking about, <laughs> we're talking about what we're eating, right? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not allowed to give stock picks. So I know. I was. The we're talking about what we're eating. Well, that that's easy. I'm it's definitely huge, Bojangles. I'm a huge Popeyes fan, and actually, oh. that was when I was at uh, at Sedoti, That was my favorite name for for several years in a row. They, it's uh, just because so you live in New York, you you can't get Bojangles. If you could get Bojangles, <laughs> you'd, you'd know. Um, but they're all. I mean, it's weird because you see the quality of all of them feels much worse. Or maybe I've just gotten older and I notice it and becoming a grumpy old man. Um, yes, you know, yes. chickens, go, chickens <laughs> exploded, man. The, the popularity of chicken has exploded. You know, as I mentioned earlier, spicy food is is exploded, and and um, it's just it's in their wheelhouse, right? Yeah. All right, Dunkin' or Starbucks? No, I'm just kidding. Why, <laughs> why don't we? <laughs> this is fun. I like yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Wendy's or McDonald's? Uh, well, that. Uh, we... Yeah, so you're right. Yeah, I mean, if I'm just going to eat, I'm probably going to Wendy's. But well, I mean, we're just McDonald's, teasing you now. <laughs> McDonald's has knocked the cover off the ball, though, man. McDonald's has really knocked the cover off the ball. They've done a phenomenal job with the, the marketing, and um, you know, uh, has been super creative over the last few years. And uh, operationally, they're always you know top notch. And uh, yeah, and then the technology piece. They they went from technology laggard to technology leader in, in just a few short years. It's been impressive. I do I do have a, like a, a casual question, but it's kind of serious. When you talk about comparisons, right? Chipotle has nobody. Am I off on that? I mean, there's oh, they, nobody. You know, they, not big fried, ones. Right? Like, and... it was, um, yeah, yeah, fresh. Right? Uh, was it? Uh, something fresh. There was Quidoba. There was there's, Quidoba uh, is the other yeah. one. Um, but you know what? Chipotle did a good job of. First of all, I think the quality was better at Chipotle. Um, also, Chipotle, you know, they they talk about the sustainability. They give to charity, and and they talk about these kind of things. And so people want to be associated with brands and associated with with things that are bigger than themselves. They want to uh, be a part of a chain that gives to charity and treats their employees well, and all of that good stuff. And and so Chipotle hit on all of these, you know, major trends in 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 eating and in restaurants uh, very early on, and that's been a game changer for them, without a doubt. Well, and the price of their guacamole is only slightly cost prohibitive. So. <laughs> it depends on the crop. You know, it depends yeah. on the crop. It changes year to year. That's one of the few items in the restaurant industry that you'll see price fluctuation. You'll see the price, uh, you know, and wings is the other one, chicken wings. So those are two very volatile commodities and you'll see change actually decrease the price of them at times. Mm. This this past weekend, I went to a, a a thing for family and friends and we did the hot wing the hot ones contest um you know this thing where they have the 10 hot sauces and the, the last one's two million scovilles and we got anchor bar wings delivered to dip them in like uh so can't beat that um i got through all 10 um impressive yeah which uh, is why he was off on monday recovery <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> a robot did not make them uh i guess uh we're at the top of the hour i guess uh mike thank you for joining us again it was a lot of fun um we'll have the distilled out on this next week and uh i don't know dan this is your area maybe i'll let you take it off you got any more well, rapid fires you know i i just keep I keep looking at Eric Connolly and I'm like thinking we got to have like everybody's pets, you know, come on. I love it. Thanks Eric for bringing your, 
What's the what, what's your pet's what what's your cat's name by the way? It's Boo, Halloween cat. Boo, Boo. Okay, yeah. So yeah, um, thanks everybody for coming. I you know this is like my favorite hour. I hope it is for the you know for everybody else and and Michael, uh, you know, Helen. Thank you. You know, um, I'm going to keep the dialogue going with you, uh, Lily. Thanks for your question. Um, uh, I'll talk to you offline on, on the question. I think I have the answer too. Um, and Daniel as well. We appreciate the engagement. And Warren, yeah, you're right. Food trucks are a problem, man. Thanks very much. But we, <laughs> they you know, stink. <laughs> they stink. Exactly. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, boo. everybody. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> meow, meow, boo. Ha, ha, ha.